So good morning. My name is Mary Beth Dunn, and I want to thank you for joining this telepressor sponsored by Physicians for Social Responsibility Florida. PSR Florida is a nonprofit organization of medical and health professionals that was founded in Tampa in 2008 and expanded to cover the entire state in 2012. We're a chapter of National PSR, a Nobel Prize winning organization based in Washington, D.C. Here in Florida, Florida, we use our medical and public health expertise to educate and advocate on issues we see as the gravest threats to human health, including climate change and fracking, and we work to promote clean energy solutions. Florida, as we know, is particularly vulnerable to climate impacts. Sea level is rising, weather events are becoming more severe, we're seeing more sunny day flooding and rising temperatures, all of which have an impact on human health. Today, we're honored to have with us Congresswoman Kathy Castor, who is a national leader on clean energy, environmental justice, coastal protection, and addressing the climate crisis. Congresswoman Castor is serving her seventh term representing Florida's 14th Congressional District, which includes Tampa and parts of Hillsborough County. She's the chair of the U.S. House Select Committee of the, on the Climate Crisis. The committee recently unveiled a comprehensive plan titled Solving the Climate Crisis, the Congressional Action Plan for a Clean Energy Economy and a Healthy, Resilient, and Just America. The report lays out climate cr crisis action plan full of detailed, ambitious, and actionable climate solutions that Congress should enact to benefit American families and communities across the nation. We'll also hear from Dr. Lynn Ringenberg, who is Professor Emeritus of Pediatrics at the University of South Florida in Tampa. She's co-founder of the Florida Chapter of Physicians for Social Responsibility and past president of National Physicians for Social Responsibility. Dr. Ringenberg will talk about children's health, marginalized communities, and how communities of color are disproportionately affected by the climate crisis. Dr. Abby Strauss, a psychiatrist in Boca Raton, Florida, and host of the Expert Speak, a free podcast about mental and general health, will address how climate change affects mental and emotional health. And finally, we'll hear from Dr. Sandra Gump, Associate Professor, University of South Florida Division of Infectious Diseases and International Medicine. Dr. Gomp will discuss the impacts of extreme weather events on emerging and infectious disease. At the end of the presentation, we'll take some questions. You can type your questions into the question box or you can raise your hand and we'll unmute you so that you can ask your question. We'll email out a recording of the webinar and full bios of our speakers and contact information following the presentation. So with that, I'll hand it over to Congresswoman Castor. Well, good morning, everyone. I want to thank P PSR Florida uh, for bringing us all together today, uh, especially Dr. Lynn Ringenberg, who has uh, encouraged me uh, for many years on public policy relating to, to public health and, uh, and clean energy as well. Uh, so thanks, Lynn. Uh, and I want to thank everyone, uh, all of the, the medical professionals we have with us today. Thank you for helping us through the COVID-19 pandemic, everything you're doing to help keep our families safe. We have our work cut out for us in the coming months, but it's only through listening to sound public health advice will we be able to, to weather this storm. Uh, and thank you, PSR Florida, for highlighting the Solving the Climate Crisis Action Plan. Uh, it is, it's a recently released 500 page plus report uh, that lays out a sweeping and urgent call to action uh, to solve the climate crisis and build back better uh, in America from the harm inflicted from COVID-19 and its economic fallout. Uh, our action plan comes at a critical time when many of our neighbors across this country are out of work. Uh, it comes at a critical time when it's never been more important to heed the scientific warnings. Uh, and the science is clear. Uh, we have more uh, carbon pollution in the atmosphere than ever before. We're in the midst of a global pandemic. Uh, the air we breathe is critical to our health. Uh, we're also at this point in history uh, 
in a time when folks are reckoning with the racial injustice following the murder of George Floyd and others. Uh, so it was with all of that that had come to bear that the committee, uh, the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis, uh, rolled out its report at the end of June after over a year of soliciting input from scientists, entrepreneurs, environmental justice leaders, uh, youth activists. And I want to thank uh, PSR National for providing some uh, important recommendations when it comes to public health, especially. Uh, the committee, uh, it, when you review our recommendations, you will see that we center uh, the entire report on environmental justice because we want to, as we build back better and build the clean energy economy and reinforce our public health infrastructure in America, we want to right some of the wrongs, uh, some of the cumulative impacts of pollution, especially in communities of color and environmental justice communities. Uh, so we, the committee was committed to ensure that environmental justice and our vulnerable communities are at the center of the solutions we propose and the health of our families uh, and the air we breathe uh, are at the heart of our plan. Uh, the, the climate crisis is a public health threat multiplier. It's intensifying heat waves. Uh, it's degrading our air quality. Uh, it's increasing, increasing the risk of infectious diseases and exposing people to more intense disasters that f harm the physical, mental, uh, and social health of our neighbors. And those of us here in Florida, we, we see the impacts of our changing climate firsthand every day. Extreme heat, uh, longer and hotter summers, and more intense hurricanes and rain events that exacerbate the ongoing flooding and, and failing infrastructure problems. Um, our frontline communities are, are disproportionately exposed to climate-related health impacts, and they face compounding challenges of insufficient access to health care, uh, safe and sanitary housing, uh, and nutrition. Uh, but I think COVID and the crisis climate coming together have really expose the weaknesses now in our public health systems. So um, weaknesses in our supply chains, just those basic testing supplies have been a challenge. The healthcare infrastructure is increasingly strained and we've seen reduced capacity now to respond to disasters and uh, burgeoning public health crises. Florida and the US have struggled to gather and report even basic health data that can inform the public and policymakers on what to do during a crisis. So our plan uh, seeks to bolster our nation's public health systems for the climate crisis and for COVID. Uh, it will, what we recommend is national planning and global leadership along with investments in community preparedness, resilience for our hospitals and health infrastructure. And, uh, We've got to expand the resources for our public health departments, for our health facilities uh, and households so that they can, we can build in greater physical, social and mental health resilience as we move forward. Uh, so you'll see many recommendations on public health. You would think, okay, the climate crisis, you're pushing ahead for clean energy. Uh, would there be health? recommendations contained here and yes because we understand the impact of the climate uh, crisis on the health of the public the health of our neighbors and uh, especially our kids and in the end we have a moral obligation to our kids to to take these on to take this on uh, so you'll see uh, throughout the report significant uh, recommendations to uh, tackle environmental health and ensure that our, our federal agencies take into account the cumulative <laughs> impacts that build up over decades and decades and the impact and try to resolve some of those cumulative impacts and make sure we're not going to continue to burden those communities with the, the latest toxic waste dump or polluting uh, facility. We need to, to take that into account. So thanks again. 
PSR. I look forward to getting into some of the nitty gritty of, of, uh, of what you will highlight in this report. Help us prioritize because now our, our assignment is to march forward and pass a lot of the recommendations into law. And to do that, we're going to need your help. We're going to need to build the coalitions uh, to get that done to, to serve our community. So thanks again. Thank you, Representative Castor. We really appreciate your leadership and your support, and uh, we're absolutely in your corner, and we will be there to push these policies forward and um, protect public health. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Lynn Ringenberg, who is the co-founder of the Florida Chapter of Physicians for Social Responsibility, and she's going to talk about children's health, marginalized communities, and how communities of color are disproportionately affected by the climate crisis. Um, unfortunately, we had a little glitch with her uh, webcam, so we're not going to be able to see her smiling face, um, <laughs> but <laughs> we will hear her, her wisdom. <laughs> so with that, I'll turn it over to you, Lynn. Okay, thanks, Mary Beth, and good morning, Congresswoman Castor. It's so great to see you, and I, I wish that I could see you here, but um, anyway, I just want to echo what Beth said about thanking you for your leadership and putting together this robust plan to tackle the climate crisis, and I actually read all 500 plus pages, and this is going to protect our communities and especially our children and our vulnerable populations from the devastating impact that we're seeing from water, air, and environmental toxic pollution. And, and by the way, thanks for getting some electric buses finally to Tampa Bay. You know, these <laughs> clean forms of transportation will have immediate health benefits, um, especially a decrease in exacerbations of asthma and other lung issues by just getting the fossil fuel powered buses off the streets. And I hope they're not just putting those buses someplace else. I hope they're retiring those uh, fossil fuel buses and uh, we need to get that up to 100%. So thank you for getting those buses here, those electric buses, that's the future. And you know, I, you've heard this multiple times, but let me stress it again, is everything we are experiencing with climate change, everything, whether it's from sea level rise, worsening storms, flooding, increases in heat, vector and waterborne diseases, food and water insecurity, wildfires, worsening allergies, issues in mental health that you'll hear later about, decreases in our community cohesion, population migrations, civil conflict, and the increased increase in greenhouse gas pollution from burning fossil fuels, all of these things harm human health. There's nothing happening with the climate crisis that doesn't affect human health. That's why it's so critical. And that's why your report is so critical. Um, according to the World Health Organization, pollution, both indoor and outdoor pollution, kills between seven and eight million people. Kind of hard to get your arms around that, but seven to eight million people a year globally. And 88% of the disease burden caused by the climate crisis is occurring in children less than five years old. Think about that. Think of that burden we are placing on children. And by the way, these kids are the future of the country and, and we must do everything we can to protect them. And you know, Congresswoman Castor, you have been a champion for children and families the decade and a half, or maybe it's two decades that I have known you and, and worked with you and um, admired the work that you do. Uh, for the future of our kids and families. So I know that you will stay on top of this and we'll help you do that. And we know that this burden and these deaths disproportionately affect our poor communities and our communities of color. You look at the inner city heat islands, you look at the increase in ozone, and you look at the coal fired and natural gas power plants. Um, you don't see these by gated communities. You see these uh, in low income and communities of color. Uh, a recent study just published uh, in the Journal of the American Medical Association, one of the most prestigious journals in this country, reports serious adverse pregnancy outcomes like preterm and low birth weight deliveries and stillbirths from the pot fine particle air pollution and heat that is worsening every day from the burning of fossil fuels. And again, disproportionately, it harms our communities of color, our low-income communities, 
And we know that these are the same communities that are being hit hardest by the COVID pandemic due to disparities in health, wellness, and economic well-being. African Americans are four times more likely to die from COVID than the white population. Our Native American population are five times more likely to die uh, from COVID. And so this is something that, that, that this pandemic is really bringing to light and for all of us to um, get right. Um, as the report covers in Pillar 7, public health departments across the country must have more funding to manage the climate crisis. Without targeted funding to target high-risk populations and communities of color, these health disparities will only worsen. The Lancet report, which is the most prestigious medical journal in the world, uh, reported in uh, 2018, the report for the US, they found that health departments seriously underfunded to take on the climate-related health harms occurring with climate change. So we should really ask this question, I think, is why are we spending close to $2 trillion over the next 30 years to upgrade and develop new nuclear weapons technology and delivery systems that we must never use when we need this money to fight for other important things in our country, like the climate crisis and, and literally save the planet for future generations? And, and lastly, you know, we urgently need federal funding and investment in a nationwide strategy on educating future doctors. This has been a passion of mine, my 25 years at USF, to uh, not only educate nurses, uh, doctors and nurses and other healthcare professionals on the harmful intersection of climate change and health, but to better prepare health professionals both nationally and locally for the next pandemic, because there will be a next pandemic. And I'm, I'm currently working, I just wanna share this very quickly, I'm currently working with the uh, medical students at USF in Tampa and FIU in Miami, and uh, just recently uh, a group at the University of Florida and also FSU to see how we can weave the health risks of climate change into the existing curriculum to ensure that they understand the complexities of the harm that climate change is doing to their patients' health. Again, especially to those most vulnerable, our pregnant women, our children, the elderly, those with disabilities and chronic diseases, the homeless, the low income and communities of color. So Congresswoman, thank you. Your action plan has provided a detailed blueprint on how we can solve the climate crisis. And we need to really do it quickly. We don't have a lot of time to talk. We need action. It's an action plan. We need to make decisions because our climate is warming and the, the scientists say eight to 10 years to kind of turn things around. So again, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ringenberg. And thank you for being such a leader to our next generation of medical professionals. That's very important. Our next presenter is Dr. Abby Strauss, a psychiatrist in Boca Raton, Florida. And he's going to talk about the psychological impacts um, of a cl cl changing climate. Dr. Strauss. You have to unmute yourself. How's that? There you go. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. The technology always wins. <laughs> and then you have to hit the little button for the webcam so we can see your face as well. Okay. Because I can see it here. Okay. How's that? Is it working? There we go. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. And Representative Castor, thank you so much for doing all this work. We need more people like you. And th that goes to the rest of the members of the committee as well. Thank you. I also want to thank the Physicians for Social Responsibility. It's an organization that goes back many years and their efforts have been to study, educate, advocate with passion and solid data in ways to make the world safer for all of us. So thank you. The Select Committee's preface in their report, there is a short declaration that says we cannot wait. It may be that we are temporarily sidetracked with other important issues, but we cannot lose sight of the ultimate denominator that can assault and massively change our communities. 
And that is the disruption, the absolute disruption of the biosphere, the biosphere in which we all live. So what can we do about this in regards to both general and mental health? Well, we need to scientifically and realistically invest in protecting us and our children. At one level, this is very simple. And here are some of the views that I have on it, but obviously they become complicated as they have to be uh, executed. We need to protect our energy systems, water systems, farmlands, coastal clinics, and so on as much as possible, because without them, we are not going to be able to live in the society that we are accustomed to. It's going to take away from our emotional safety as well. People in Florida are already discussing sea level rise and what's going to happen to their homes in the next 20, 30, 40 years. This is emotionally very destabilizing. We need to have a leadership teacher self-discipline. Hold on, spam call, sorry about that. We need to have, again, as I said, a leadership that will teach us self-discipline rather than giving us short-term goals with long-term indifference because we are going to have to learn to self-discipline ourselves to a different lifestyle and environment if things continue like this. We need to teach and practice the precautionary principle and it basically says we should be safe rather than sorry. It takes a lot of planning and honest, sometimes painful introspection to understand of what we can do and we what we cannot. We need help to learn that we are personally responsible for some of the climate change events and that we cannot assume that technology will allow us to live the same lifestyle but with perhaps less carbon output. We are responsible and we have to grab a hold of it ourselves. A lot of people emotionally just want someone else to fix it for us. That's not the way it is anymore. We also need to know that there are indeed numerous studies about the various connections between environmental pollutions and an increased risk for psychiatric disorders. The same goes for medical issues as well, cardiovascular issues and so on. But I'm a psychiatrist, I'm gonna focus on this. The list of data coming out is long. The data is indeed involving, but it's involving, it's evolving, shall we say, in the same direction and that there are really negative health effects of air pollution, pesticides, and the like on the incidence of psychiatric conditions and on our neurologic and psychological developments. One of the ever-present solid pieces of knowledge is the effect of, of mercury on unborn children and how coal-fired power plants release mercury that ends up in our food and our drinking water. People read these and it is psychologically unnerving because it's not like a bad marriage, so to speak, that you can get away from. It's pollution in the air and in the water that we cannot get away from. And we need to have that perspective. We are currently seeing a very significant rise in mental health problems secondary to the imposition necessary to control the coronavirus. Imagine what it would be like for people not to have clean air or water. There has even been talks of wars over water supplies. We have to be able to, or perhaps we have to be taught if that happens, to live differently than the way we may have otherwise lived. Psychologically, these are enormous issues that people are being, are giving a lot of thought to. One, recommend, one recommendation that has always been key to me is that we should create a group similar to VISTA, Volunteers in Service to America, whose goal would be to teach young people how to make substantive changes in their environment and how to educate and formulate attitudes that work. One spin-off of this would be the development of a large group of people who had a passion and hence a focus in life to better their environment. The mental health spin-off of this could be enormous. It takes the climate change issues from their problem to my problem. It empowers people and it makes them feel connected, protective, and proud of their local communities and their larger communities. So, Representative, thank you so much for your report. We cannot lose the momentum that Pray Tell This brings to our community and to the other speakers as well. Let's just continue our work and make this a better world for ourselves and our children. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Strauss, and thank you for bringing to the forefront the often overlooked impacts of mental health and climate change. Next, we're going to hear from Dr. Sandra Goff, who's going to talk about extreme weather events and emerging and infectious diseases. Dr. Goff? 
Good morning. Thank you, thank you uh, Congresswoman, for bringing this issue to the fore at such a, a difficult time, uh, even during a, a pandemic. Um, really, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, emphasized, has exposed really the weaknesses, uh, the profound weaknesses of our public health infrastructure. Uh, so, this is a, a very important um, action plan to bring forward, and and it provides this report provides actionable items. It's not just another report. Oh, this is what's happening. Um, this is what we should do. Here is what we can do. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, as an infectious disease specialist, as an educator, uh, as a mother. Uh, thank you for doing this. Um, you know, uh, in the infectious disease field, uh, we uh, study not only of uh, the wide range of, it, of infections, but, you know, it involves uh, every organ system, it involves knowing a little bit about ecology, knowing uh, about historical trends, about psychosocial situations. Um, so uh, it, one of the things that we've observed in the infectious disease field over the last 20, 30 years is that climate change uh, is increasingly a driver uh, of infections, uh, old and new across the United States, but uh, Florida is in the crosshairs. You know, experts tell us that we maybe have 10 years to mitigate, mitigate the effects of climate change before uh, temperature rises are irreversible. And climate change is an, an, a critical, uh, of critical importance to Floridians. We are in the subtropics. Uh, in fact, those of us who've lived here, who've grown up here, uh, are, have observed that our subtropical climate uh, and weather has expanded from South Florida north uh, over that period of time. We're seeing in every single year increasing temperatures, increasing humidity, uh, much shorter winters, uh, much warmer winters. And we are certainly uh, at higher risks for extreme weather like hurricanes and flooding and all of those things impact infectious diseases. They in particular uh, impact mosquitoes and ticks, uh, which are vectors of many infectious diseases. Over the past uh, 20 years, uh, CDC has documented uh, at least nine new inf uh, insect-borne infections in humans in the United States. Uh, we are, of course, uh, impacted by the life cycle of mosquitoes, which uh, sometimes I think should be our state bird. Uh, <laughs> The 80s mosquitoes, and mosquito in particular, breeds much more quickly with warmer temperatures. Uh, for uh, one of the, the diseases that currently impacts us the most that's mosquito-borne is dengue. We used to, when I was in training, dengue was a disease of travelers, a travel-related infection. We had to know it uh, from the textbook just in case we saw one. And now it's endemic in South Florida. Uh, in the Florida Keys. Just um, last year, there was uh, there were 17 cases of dengue in Hillsborough, and in South Florida, there were local uh, cases, uh, locally transmitted cases this year. Uh, we're in the midst of uh, an outbreak of locally acquired dengue in Key Largo. We've had 26 cases this year. Uh, Florida is now a hotspot for dengue, which for me is an extraordinary uh, thing to say. Uh, we also have to be concerned uh, about things like Zika virus. Zika emerged in the Western Hemisphere uh, in 2014, and we had local, uh, locally acquired cases in, in the U.S., uh, in particular in Florida, in St. Petersburg and South Florida. We had nine cases uh, across uh, of local of local transmission across 21 states uh, of Zika. Ticks, however, uh, we don't think about ticks very much, but ticks are a serious issue. Uh, ticks 
need more than 85% humidity to breed and they will survive up to 130 degrees Fahrenheit temperatures. Uh, they normally uh, would, uh, would not overwinter. They normally would die off in uh, states north of us, but in many areas they're no longer dying off during the winter and people are uh, having, they're, they're breeding actually through the winter and people are acquiring Lyme disease. Uh, even in the winter, which which has been unheard of. Just in the past 15 years, Lyme disease in the U.S. has increased uh, at least 300 percent, which is extraordinary and is now found in the Midwest uh, and uh, maybe spreading in the Southeast, which would impact us. We no longer will, will just be seeing cases of Lyme disease in our, from our snowbirds traveling down uh, from up north. And you know the the other things that we tend not to think of so much uh, in Florida, but but are an issue. We are at high risk for an increasing number of waterborne and heat loving uh, uh, pathogens. For example, the flesh eating, flesh -eating bacteria Vibrio uh, is heat loving. Uh, it loves warm temperatures. Um, uh, Legionella. Legionella uh, can affect uh, many of our older residents, or re people with lung disease. Uh, it lives in plumbing, uh, especially with warm temperatures. It's it's heat loving. Um, one of the uh, one of the things that has impacted me personally is brain eating amoeba, Nigleria fowleri, and newer ones like Balamuthia mandrillaris which have also been diagnosed uh, as causes of brain eating, uh, amoebic meningitis uh, in children in Florida. That is a heat loving organism. It thrives in warm temperatures in, in our Florida lakes. Um, uh, there are many more issues. There's uh, mycobacterial infections uh, of the lungs that, uh, that uh, impact people with underlying lung disease. It's devastating. It's like having tuberculosis. It's like watching some of these patients um, uh, suffer with this. It's like watching the old consumption uh, that we re read about in books and movies and watching movies. Uh, it's extraordinarily difficult to treat uh, and uh, causes tremendous human suffering. Um, all of these things impact Florida's economy. Uh, it impacts uh, our tourism. Uh, which we heavily depend on. And it is a matter of our, uh, our not only economic security, but our, our, our uh, it's homeland security. It is, it is a matter of homeland security. And we need, uh, we need a, a strong public health infrastructure. We need public health uh, funding uh, to permit detection of new infections, of new pathogens, tracking of, of these infections, um, studying them to find out what we need to do to um, prevent them, to cure them, to, um, to mitigate the, the causes. So, you know, all of this, uh, you know, COVID-19 has, has really uh, highlighted uh, how much we really need to do and we don't have any time. This is, this is it, we do it now or we lose the battle um, because uh, you know, the, the, it's just, the time is just too short and, and we've got to get this done. So thank you uh, again, Congresswoman Castor for, for doing this, for publishing this report. There are many things that we can get done uh, and I appreciate that, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Dr. Gomp. Uh, boy, we really do have a lot of work to do. Um, thank you to all the panelists. Um, at this point, we can go ahead and open it up to questions. Um, Julia, can I don't see any questions in the in the box, but can we um, open up the the lines to see if anybody has any questions that they would like to ask at this point? I know we did go a couple of minutes over. Hopefully people are still there. 
Oop, did I lose Julia too? No, it doesn't look like, um, there's no uh, raised hands right now, so. Okay, okay. great, wow. Um, okay, well, I appreciate everybody. This is you know, absolutely something that we need to work on right now. We cannot wait um, and having this roadmap is really going to you know, help us get this work done. Um, we are going to, this, this webinar has been recorded, um, so we're gonna send it out. We have um, over a hundred, I think, um, press uh, folks that we're sending it out to. And so hopefully we'll get some calls, we'll get some press and um, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get working. We have no time to waste. So with that, I'd like to. Hey, 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 Beth. Yes. Hey, this is Lynn. Could I just say something very quickly? Sure. Kathy, uh, Kathy are you still on? I am. I just wanted to wish you a happy birthday. Happy <laughs> <laughs> well, birthday, nice. happy birthday to Kathy, <laughs> to the Cosmos Woman. Happy birthday. <laughs> yes, many, many more it, happy birthdays. <laughs> it is my birthday tomorrow. Yes. So that is very thoughtful of you. <laughs> so my my birthday wish is that uh, we all work together to uh, highlight the recommendations in this report because there's nothing worse, as a few of you mentioned, that a big 500 page <laughs> plus action plan goes and sits on the shelf. But the good news is that a few days after we rolled out the report, uh, the House of Representatives passed a transportation infrastructure package that we're required to do every five years, and that contained a lot of uh, our action plan items, especially on helping to make our local water, wastewater systems more resilient to climate impacts. You know, one thing that has really hit home here in Florida when we have those extreme weather events, a lot of our uh, sewage and wastewater facilities have right. to dump uh, their wastewater into into Tampa Bay or to, to Boca Ciega Bay. And this happens all across the state. And that's a serious public health issue. Uh, and then even with the defense bill that passed uh, a few weeks after our action plan, it contained a lot of our recommendations to help make um, our installations more resilient. But DOD has been a leader on on some clean energy issues so we want them to continue to do so but until we we really work on the transition to our clean energy economy trying to get to net zero as soon as possible but no later than 2050 and and then building on the resilience um we 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 are going to see uh continued public health impacts and a lot of unfairness it throughout society so thank you, PSR Florida. Uh, thanks to the, the great doctors who are on today. I, I truly appreciate it. Let's march on. Thank great. you. Thank you. We appreciate you. Anybody else have a parting word? No. Okay. Well, thank you. Thanks, Look forward to working with everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks again. Yeah.